I'm Matt Byron, and this is the Marketing Strategies Podcast, where I speak with interesting and well-respected marketers from high-growth companies. We'll discuss the strategies they've used to generate traffic, acquire new users, and grow their business. I know on day 30, if you are going to renew or churn on day 365. It's a little bit of mind control. You need to reach the leads in a specific time frame. The faster, the better. You know, when something works, don't do more like it, do more with it. If you're selling to a very finite audience, an inbound model is going to be grossly inefficient. This audience has what top questions, and then make sure that you have an answer to each of their questions. We don't hire professional writers to write for the blog. We hire sales operations practitioners. Whoever gets closest to the customer wins. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Marketing Strategies Podcast. Today I'm joined by Jay Akunzo. Jay has held prominent positions as digital marketing strategist for Google, head of content for HubSpot, and vice president of platform for the VC firm Nextview Ventures. He's now host of his podcast, Unthinkable, which was called one of the hottest new podcasts out there by Entrepreneur and is now 74 episodes deep. Jay is also a regular speaker at events such as Content Marketing World, Social Media Marketing World, South by Southwest, and many others. It's a pleasure to have some of your time today, Jay. How are you doing? I'm well, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate everybody else who's listening too. Yeah, you're welcome. Great to have you with us today. Um, in this episode, um, I'd love to cover a few of the marketing tactics you've used in the past, things you've learned as your career has progressed, and then I'd really love to talk, uh, take a bit of time to talk about your podcast, the, the success you've had, and how you market and promote it. Sounds great. Cool. Um, I'm going to start a little earlier in your career, though, at your time at Google. Um, your job was digital marketing strategist, which involved helping brands create ad campaigns online. Correct. Yeah, I worked on the AdWords team. Yep. Oh, the AdWords team. And what what type of campaigns were you putting together for for brands? I I worked for it with three different types of groups depending on when in my Google tenure we're speaking. So one was agencies, uh, the other was CPG brands, and then the third were kind of small to medium sized businesses that were just getting started with digital marketing. So you can imagine the first two groups were familiar with Google products and they they benefit benefited from working with Google reps such as myself to understand the product and the trend behind why Google developed that product. Whereas the small businesses were really just looking to understand digital and, and get started with their first you know search campaign, for example. So it was really split across search, display, mobile, and YouTube. Um, but to be honest, I, I hated it. I absolutely hated the job because I felt I felt like every time I consumed the product of my work, I didn't like this stuff. I didn't want to be interrupted before I watched a YouTube video. I didn't want to see ads all over a, a media site that popped out or or spilled down or slid in. Like I, I, my own sensibilities had been on pause while I worked there because I loved the brand, I loved the people, I learned a ton. I think Google is a fantastic company, but doing that job for me anyway just was uh, I don't know it was it was soul sucking it was it was doing everything I could to interrupt somebody's flow instead of become the object of what they were trying to choose which is content. Yeah, and I listened to one of your most recent podcast episodes where you say that you know when you were working at Google you found a great YouTube video and you gathered a bunch of friends to watch it and while you were loading the video you were bigging it up and getting their expectations higher and higher and then when you finally got the video up on screen the pre-roll played before <laughs> and you just felt overwhelming frustration uh, you know the anticipation had all been put on hold and you saw something that you didn't want to see in advance of the video that you did want to see. Um, um, right. That was just really interesting for me that you would actually look at look at I guess the pre roll that way something that you would um, help the customer create or you know suggested that they use for example um, and then you'd felt such frustration with seeing it in the first place. Um, I mean it's it's interesting to to, to learn that. How, how do you do you feel about that particular marketing tactic? It's obviously had some some success or it continues to have a lot of success for for many brands um, that see it. it's almost like. YouTube is the new TV and these are the new adverts really um, but many people feel the same frustration that you feel well I, I feel like marketers today are, are, are still 
suffering from these echoes of mass media and mass media thinking, even if the tactic itself isn't actually mass media, like retargeting or something like that, because we, we obsess over big top line numbers instead of productivity. And, and, you know, we obsess over 0.01%. Great campaign guys. 0.01% click through our display ads. Whereas (laughs) what about the 99.9% that either ignored you or outright hates you and also has a microphone to tell others how much they despise you. And so I think paid is fine, but you have to do it tactfully. You have to create stuff people want because all of this stuff, marketing strategies and tactics, it sits on top of a foundational human layer or human insight that we need to get wise to, which is that because the consumer has all the power, meaning we have endless choice as consumers and millions of options within every little niche and multiple screens, we don't care about anything a brand has to tell us unless they tell us something we care about. So in that story, I was trying to show my friends a great video and a pre-roll ad about a car popped up. Now, maybe somewhere tangentially in the minds of those marketers, the car was relevant to the video, but in that moment, the expectation that I had didn't match the message I received, which which I think is how spam forms. It's when your expectation doesn't meet what happens, right? It's fine to hear from an email newsletter if you expect it, if you subscribed, but if somebody added you and you didn't ask for it and they send you their email newsletter, that's spam. So it's this disruption of your expectation as a consumer. And today the knee-jerk reaction is, I hate you, I don't want you, (laughs) and I have millions of options to get around you. So in that one instance, I recognized this pre-roll ad as my uh, friend at Google's client. And I was like, oh my God, Eric, how could you? And then I realized, well, hold on. I had the same job at Google that Eric had, which means that somebody somewhere hated a moment in their day because of something I did for a living. And We do a lot of mental gymnastics to justify why that's fine. Well, look, I have numbers to hit. Uh, My boss, my team, my client. Oh, look, 3% converted. 97% we don't seem to care about, by the way. But these mental gymnastics justify what I think is a tough pill we need to swallow, which is it's not working. These are small numbers and people don't want it. People don't like it. And I, so I want to build a career based on creating things people actually do want. In other words, turning a low probability event, like a click through on an ad into a high probability event, like subscribers coming back for more content. Yeah, it's so interesting. And it's also so easily forgotten is that that high percentage, the 95%, for example, that don't convert on a page or don't click on an ad. And I guess that all, that partly comes down to context that you've mentioned. You know, in what context does that come? Is it a paid, paid search ad, in which case you're actually typing something in and you want to find something relevant following that? Or at the other end of the spectrum might be the uh, interruptive advert that shows where you, where you don't really want or expect it. Um, I guess a question here would be, how do you think the world of marketing is improving with targeting to make sure that the adverts or the, should I say, the content that's being uh, displayed to people is more relevant to them and more useful to them uh, as, as time moves on. So I guess retargeting or data uh, to the degree that we can gather it today about the consumer, all of this stuff, these are just tactics that's, again, sit on top of a more foundational layer, which is whoever gets closest to the customer wins. You know, imagine a world where you actually knew everybody you marketed to offline and in person. How easy would your job be, right? Obviously, that, that world doesn't exist, but you can get closer and closer to actually knowing who you're who you're trying to reach and who, more importantly, who you're trying to resonate with. And all of these tools and tactics and techniques we obsess over, but they serve one cause, which is how do you understand the audience better than somebody else? And if you can address your more fundamental insight about an audience member compared to a a competitor, your audience will pay more attention to you because they'll throw up their arms and say, finally, somebody gets me. You're speaking my language. You get why I'm buying or why I'm here. You know, nobody buys a better pillow, they're buying a better night's sleep. But we're obsessed with marketing the pillow because we're marketers. People don't care about that stuff unless it's that small little percent that's right there ready to buy. The vast majority of people you reach with your marketing, in other words, the way you build a thriving organization, is to actually fundamentally understand the audience and what they're going through and why they should care about what you have to say. And so you mentioned, what does targeting do for that? 
I, I don't know, I guess targeting is the manifestation of when you know the audience enough to go to market with that insight. But I think too often marketers don't dig deep enough and have that insight. And, and, and you know, Matt, I'm, ha I'm, I'm getting a little long winded here. I'm happy to share some stories and case studies about exactly what I mean, but, but that's the theory. It's get to know the customer better than your competitors and all the other tools and technologies help you do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's still times when, you know, something pops up on say Instagram for me or something pops up on a channel for me. And I'm like, I didn't ask for this, but this is actually really cool. This is actually something I'd be really interested in. So I definitely still think there's a place for um, some form of interruptive marketing that actually helps you uh, discover new products, new um, services, new concepts or ways of doing things but I totally totally agree with you that actually well for every we're, we're playing the lottery we're scratching yeah. off a ticket hoping that oh my god at some point we're gonna hit 30 bucks worth of value here you know in our minds our bosses want three thirty thousand but you know what you're talking about is occasionally once in a while it's nice when yeah and every so <laughs> often right what, what what I'm talking about is every time you go to yeah. market make the dollars count right? Every time you do an activity, make the calories count. Do something worthwhile, not throw up a bunch of stuff onto the wall and hope something sticks, which has been the marketing mentality. I'm going to blanket the world in my message and hope that I catch some actual fish in this net. And really, I either catch very little or I catch a bunch of garbage. But look, here's a couple fish and I'm justifying that action. And we've got... So, no, I was just going to say, I, I disagree that interruptive tactics because they're interruptive, can work. I think it's it's still, you, what are you putting into that channel that matters, right? And if it's something people don't, don't want or not asking for, you're like praying to the digital gods that, oh God, please, if I just target people in this region or people of this profile, I hope a small percent actually buys because I have my numbers to hit. And I get it. But we can turn that low probability event into a higher probability event if we actually understood the customer first and then delivered something that they actually wanted, right? Start with resonance because reach has never been easier. And we're in the age now where we've got the, the tools and ability to really do this on a, a, you know, a big scale, actually, is be um, personal and, and give people what they want from our brand more than uh, be, uh, you know, actually uh, almost make friends with every single one of your customers, no matter how many customers you have. It's, you know, we can do that these days. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I love podcasting, because if you're listening to this, it's like a voice in your head. You might be, you know, fervently disagreeing with what I say. You know, if, if you like feel like, you know, you've built a career on interruptions and it works <laughs> and, you know, whatever. But you're, you're whatever you're doing, you're taking a strong stance. You're either feeling me or feeling something strong against me. And, you know, voice has that way of building intimacy. And in this case, with podcasting, intimacy that actually scales. It's wonderful. It does, to your point, Matt, it makes you feel like I, as a listener, know the brand through these voices. And if they're going to ask me to do something, or if I see them elsewhere, you're more likely to take an action. Like I, you know, I speak a lot. And so when I go to events, people will come up and will high five, hug, talk. And I'm like, oh no, I don't remember this person, <laughs> but they seem to yeah. know me. And it's because of my podcast, they feel an actual human kinship with me like we met before. And it's like, I, that blew me away. I'm a writer by trade, and I'd never experienced that with my writing, even though I think I'm a decent writer. But podcasting, yeah, it has this way of just building intimacy that scales. It feels like an offline interaction in a way, even though it's online or digital. Super cool. And um, coming back to the sort of the story, I guess, that we've been talking about here, that this ultimately, this this issue that you that you sort of experienced, this led you to actually quit. This led you to leave Google. That's true. Yes, I, I quit Google. I went to a small startup and I was doing sales, same as Google. And uh, the sales team was bloated. We had hired too many people too soon for the startup to support, given the revenue and the capital. And they laid off a bunch of sales people. But this is kind of the story of my career. I had been doing a bunch of side projects within the business. You know, side projects, I think, are the only reason that you were interested in even talking to me today. Like most of my career success is because I tinkered on the side of the, the day job. And in this instance, I had been creating content for the marketing team because I like to write. And I'd obviously seen a lot and heard a lot by talking to customers as a sales rep and, and then later an account executive. And so I used that to write some blog posts, create some content, build a little bit of an audience for the company. And the head of product, because it was a media startup, said, well, we're laying off half the sales team and you were probably going to be one of those people. Why don't you actually move over to my team, Jay? And you can create content for a living. 
And I was like, brilliant. This is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do in college. I wanted to be a writer. Um, and that's when I started poking around the industry and found this term, content marketing. Yep. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know about the whole marketing side of the, the world, but but the word content, yeah, let me latch onto that and start creating for a living. So I, I like to say that they told me I could write, so I showed up the next day for work. That's awesome. I mean, it's like being given your dream job really, isn't it? You, you go from the sales team to the marketing team and you want to be a writer. Perfect. I, I just felt like I found a back door. You know, my whole career, I feel like I'm, I'm pulling one over on people and I'm waiting for somebody, some suited authority to come to my door and say, sorry, sir, you're actually not allowed to be creating these podcasts and shows and speeches and blog posts without first having worked for print publications for 10 years. Like I'm waiting for someone to rip me out of the world I'm in, put me back in traditional media and say, now pay your dues for decades. <laughs> you know, I, I found this like back door into getting to create awesome stuff for a living uh, because all these businesses were hungry for creative talent, because all these businesses have better business models than advertising supported media you know I, it feels like the back way in but ah oh man i just feel so grateful that i found it yeah and you were obviously clearly sort of not i don't mean at the bottom but the, at the ground level you were you were you were new into content marketing for example you know where did you start and you very clearly had lots of success down the line uh, how did you uh, understand what was working and, and and where did you really see success yeah, I think, uh, you know, the first moment of success I had was uh, in showing my bosses early on in my career in content, strong qualitative reactions from audiences as case studies. So I think what we often want, especially when we're early in our careers, is we want to point to a piece and say, look how many leads and views or shares. Or we want to point to a campaign and say, look how many XYZ metric. And I think what we undervalue, which we can get easier than ever before, because we have direct access to an audience is the reaction of that audience. It's a powerful mechanism for understanding a couple things. Number one, is what you're doing worth investing more in? In other words, can I show this to somebody and get more resources or get promoted or you know hire a freelancer or whatever? And number two, is what I'm doing something that I should expand upon? In other words, I should in, like not only invest resources and time and people into it, but I should put it in more places where people can find it I should use this as the fodder for my paid. I should use this as multimedia. It was an article, now it's an episode or what have you. And so I think the the big lesson I learned early on is to value and seek out a small number of people who don't know you reacting in a big way to what you did because that's signal you've found something that you can expand upon. That's that's the foundational layer that marketers often miss. And then now we can build towards reach and conversions. So the analogy I use is like, we're digging holes in dry sand constantly. We're in acquisition mode and we're just digging like crazy in this sand and trying to get deeper and deeper, but the walls keep caving in, right? It's like this campaign, more pieces, more views. And the next day it seems to reset on us. But if we can, to build something that sticks, you have to start with resonance. You have to say, okay, this place in the ground is worth breaking ground in the first place because I have signal. This matters to people. And so I should invest more heavily there. I should lean into that instead of just frantically try to catch more and more and more and more. So start out looking for a small number of people reacting in a big way. I think that's the sign that you're on the right path. And where were you getting these signals or, you know, where were you getting the indications or the small groups of people that were reacting well? How did you, how did you come across this and identify these people? It's, it's very simple. I think we overcomplicate stuff way too much because we have great technology available. But it was in the comments section. It was on Twitter. It was on Facebook, offline events, emails. You know, I would show my boss, hey, I got this email from a prospect. Look at what they said. They praised this article to no end. Uh, we should reach out to them as a marketer and say, thank you so much. And by the way, we have some demos coming up. We should take the topic from that article and share it more liberally on social or what have you. So it was all the places that you probably would think of, Matt, where you just can find people talking. Um, and, and, and it wasn't like a lot of people. It was 12, 15, 20 people, right? Even though you want 12, 15, 20,000 eventually. Uh, and so it was really easy. I was shocked, you know? And, and this is just what I was trained to do as a writer. It was to try and find strong signal, not passive, but massive small and strong. And that, to me, is the difference between marketers who go on to build empires and marketers who constantly feel like they're reacting to new trends to try to figure it out. It's you build on a strong foundation, a foundation that begins with these strong signals from audience members in very obvious places that they love what you're doing, right? And oh my God, 
what a great era to be a marketer when you can say my marketing is beloved by people because in the past that was obviously not the case. So I, this is me being optimistic instead of my earlier self on this interview, which is a little pessimistic and cynical, <laughs> but I think it's a great time to be a marketer because you can find that signal so easily and you know launch radically different experiments to do so. Once one hits, drop the rest and invest more heavily in that direction because your audience is telling you, we actually love what you're doing here. And what would you do from there? You would speak with the people, find out exactly what they liked, how um, you know you might extend that further or other types of content you could actually create to support you know, their desire for what you're creating. Yeah, exactly. So let's make it real concrete. So the kind of beacon or the uh, North Star that I follow is, you know, when something works, don't do more like it, do more with it. In other words, if an article you wrote that happened to be a long form essay of thought leadership really, really worked, don't try to write more long form essays of thought leadership quite yet, maybe in the future, but take what you learned from that one piece, like rip out the information inside the container and try to distribute it in new places, quotes on social media, uh, Q and A's or AMA's on different online forums or offline events. You know, so for me with a podcast, it's an incredibly high friction thing to do to create a full show. And I'm not talking about like disparate interviews, I'm talking about a show that has a journey and a strong concept and all these mechanics to make it like a program. And so for me to justify building an episode, I need to know with more certainty than the average bear, it's gonna work. So I send out a bunch of tweets, and these are strong, opinionated tweets, and I'm just looking for a reaction from people. If I don't get it, that topic or that opinion should not become an episode. If I do get it, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 25 people responding, not just liking and retweeting, but saying something passionately, okay, maybe I write an article. And that article becomes great more content, that's awesome, I'm, I'm certain it'll work. But if the article falls flat, I haven't fleshed out that tweet into anything worth pursuing and fleshing out more into an episode. So that's the model. It's like, I'm gonna try out all of these little directions with a topic or a concept. I wanna look for the right phrasing, I wanna look for the right topics, and then I'm gonna continually look to put that in larger and larger and more public places. And then when I'm done, when I feel like I've capped out like a podcast episode, I go back down the chain. The episode becomes another few blog posts, which become more social content and on and on. So you're like testing your way up to the big thing and then distributing your way back down. That's really interesting, and I guess that makes it for, for quite an efficient production process where you're constantly testing ideas on a very small scale and then expanding the ones that, you know, that, that are getting traction, that are really working and uh, uh, giving you those signals from people. Yeah, it's involving the customer in the process too, the audience in this case. You know, I think it's, I think it's the height of insanity that we expect campaigns to work or we expect a big piece of content to stick when we don't actually inform what we're doing with the audience. You know, we jump in a room somewhere and we brainstorm. You know, developing a podcast is a really good example. It's a massive project. Like, you know firsthand, Matt, it's, this is a big project <laughs> that you have to take on. And I know it's a passion project for you, but it's still bigger than... I don't know, doing a Twitter chat with me instead. Yeah. Um, sending me five questions over email for a blog article. It's a bigger commitment for you. And so to justify that, you know, wouldn't it be great, almost like a stand-up comedian, they're a good analogy here. Stand-up comics don't just launch a Netflix special and expect it to work. They go to small clubs and they, ch they try out their material and also their performance of the material. And av after a few times of doing that, they go to a bigger stage and a bigger stage until they're like, okay, this is ready for a mass audience or a bigger audience. Whereas what we as marketers do is we go away, we build for a little while, we brainstorm, we jump in a room, quote unquote, and then we expect the big thing to get a big audience without having ever proved this with a small audience. Like that to me is, is insanity. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I really love the um, the North Star metric, uh, you know, way of thinking. Do more with it. You know, I think that's almost like a it can be a key takeaway of this. People are constantly creating content, you know, the new content um, on this topic, that topic, the other topic, but actually expanding out the content that's working best into various different formats and channels um, is is something that 
you know can be often overlooked you know for example even ourselves uh, um, uh, my brand wise Al, we, we create a video survey to find out how consumers and businesses uh, are reacting to vi uh, video and we do this every single year and we get some really really interesting results we just launched our uh, 2018 survey in January and you know it's our best performing piece of content by a long way it gets us hundreds and hundreds of um, referring links back to our site and we have constantly people talking about it and um, uh, we get it on uh, multiple different websites. It's it's really a, a prominent piece of content for us, but we still have more that we could be doing with it. Still, we could repurpose further. You know, we don't, for example, uh, use um, SlideShare, and we don't put enough on social regarding the um, regarding the results and things like that. So there's rather than actually looking for new things all the time, it's it's stick with what's working well and actually expand out. You, you just revealed something really powerful and I think great about yourself and your team, which is you've put aside your pride. And I think that that to me is the biggest missing piece in a lot of marketing organizations is there's too much pride at play. People, people believe that creativity is about brainstorming an idea or lightning strike moments and they get the credit. I, you know, I, I talked to a great um, CEO and prolific entrepreneur named David Cancel. He heads this, oh, yeah. this company. He founded uh, Drift.com. And, and David and I were talking about you know, how he would rather personally and with his team be vaguely right and uh, rather than like specifically wrong. In other words, we're so interested in like having the answer that we don't go about trying to find our own in our context. We want like the best practice that we hold up and say, I got it. It's this methodology from this expert or from my own brain. Instead, we should be investigators and try to constantly figure out what does the audience want? And so you're, you're, you're always in this game of little pivots. You're never correct. You know, the, the line, the progress is going to look very jagged, but hopefully in the macro level, it goes up and to the right. And so with David and, and his company at Drift, they're constantly trying to talk to customers at events, do video calls. I do video calls probably five to six times a month with my listeners. It doesn't quote unquote scale, but it's the most powerful thing I do because I'm always like, okay, last episode I tried to jog a little bit to the left with these topics. Okay, these five to six people said that that was only partially correct. I got to jog a little bit to the right and I'm always zigzagging. I want to be vaguely right. I'm heading in the right direction generally instead of have this very specific answer that I came up with and it feels so good that I think I'm right or I'm right in the eyes of my boss or my client, but in reality, it doesn't work with the customer. And to be right with the customer like you did with that survey, Matt, you got to put aside your pride and be like, you know what? I actually don't know the answer. However, I know how to go find it and it's going to involve the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And it's almost like a lean way of doing marketing, really, I guess, isn't it? By getting con constantly getting feedback and insight from the the people that are reading, the people that are consuming the content and actually improving and developing and building from there. Yeah, I think of it like when the first caveman invented fire, all of a sudden you have this really nuanced way of like, keeping warm and defending yourself and uh, cooking your food. You have this amazing tool that, you know, could evolve you as an individual and your clan as a bunch of cavemen and women. And uh, and then the other people who didn't get the fire were out there trying to like club their dinners and like lie next to each other under a blanket of skin. And, you know, it's a primitive way of doing it. It's a really <laughs> primitive, it's a really primitive way of doing marketing to launch campaigns that die and to have some creative director say, it's this idea, and then have the client decide, yes, you're right. It, it just We have these tools that are cheap and sometimes free to access the audience directly. And we're scared to use them because we're like, well, what if we're wrong? That, that the point is to make sure that you're right eventually, right? So you have to be wrong a little bit first to get there. You know, put out some tweets as a big brand that don't offend people, but they take little stances here and there. You know, we're so consumed with having some theoretical right answer and releasing it to the world to all kinds of joy and response that we chase that feeling. But that's such a rare thing and a rare way to succeed. Instead, we have this fire, which is social. And we can use it in so many different ways to build a business, to protect our business, to do all kinds of stuff just like Real Fire can do for us. And there's so many marketers that are like, no, me no like, me launch campaign now. <laughs> so you got me there. 
<laughs> I like the accent. And so would you in that case say um, not to really worry about failure then? Because if you're failing, you're failing small, it's not really big failure. It's really just these are the failures required to actually get to the, the topic or the idea that really works. Bingo. It's thinking big as in I see a mountain peak in the distance I want to get to and it's acting small as in it's, it's one step at a time. You know, creativity doesn't mean big. I don't know where we lost our way and thought creativity means big because we, we just see the final product of what Red Bull is today or American Express or Google, but they took all the little steps along the way. And so I think it is about these these tiny little steps. You know, a good example is if you're a marketer and you feel like your company squeezes the creativity out of you or they do things in a traditional way and you're writing blog posts, what most marketers want is they want some boss to come in with a brand new attitude that day and say, you get to write amazing stories and create, I don't know, everything you've ever dreamed of creating. Instead, instead of wishing that would happen, this big change, could you just write the next five articles with a better opening paragraph? Like you control that and that's a tiny little step in the right direction to see, am I right? Am I not? What does the audience say? Did they react? Did they not? And just t like try little tests along the way. And so to the extent that, you know, I've had success with my podcast or you've had success with yours or Red Bull is successful with their whole media house, all these things we can point to as marketers and say, well, they were successful or they're creative. We're looking at the sum total of a lot of little moments. And some of those moments were bad and some of those moments were good, but it's the sum total we're seeing. And we have to focus instead on the little moments. It's, it's the reversal of what we view creativity as. It's experimentation. And creativity, unfortunately, can be very difficult to actually measure, really. You know, it's subjective in the way that people, or one person will see it differently to the other person. What, are you, what tools or what metrics are you using on a, on a regular basis? What have you found that, that works for you to actually track? Well, with my podcast as a good example, I look for, again, the same thing. I keep it real simple, Matt. I'm a very, very simple marketer and creator because I think that you know, complexity is is often born out of confusion. And I try to always find clarity in what I'm doing first and then keep it simple in my execution. So my simple approach is uh, a fake metric that I made up. It's a real metric, but it's a, it's a fake name for this metric because people have to take me seriously because of you're interviewing me on your podcast. So <laughs> I call it URR, because if you don't have an acronym, apparently it doesn't exist in the marketing world. URR, unsolicited response rate. If you put something out in the world that's meant to resonate, like a podcast episode in my case, and you know, for me, it's a 40-ish minute episode, a little bit less, lots of story and narration and music and multiple voices and sound effects and jokes. It's my heart and soul in the world. And if I hear crickets, not the downloads, but if I don't get any comments from people who listen on Twitter, over email, anywhere offline. If nobody ever mentions that episode to me in an unsolicited way, I don't think it's a success. So I'm not going to write more articles about that. I'm not going to include that in my book. I'm not going to use that on stages and speeches. You know, it's so that's what I use whenever I experiment or launch something is, did I get a small number of people reacting in a big way? It's right back to where we began here. And if I did, I will invest more in that experiment. I'll turn the tweet into a blog post or the article into an episode, or I'll turn that episode into, you know, multiple projects, or I'll turn the whole podcast like I'm doing now into a book. And again, it's this small but strong signal that we can access so easily and freely, but we fail to look at it. And so I'm just laser focused on that because the audience is saying, this is good, we want some more. And I'm just trying to then deliver on the, the demand they're telling me they already have. And do you track this in a formal way or like a spreadsheet or are you using gut feel? No. To what end? You know, like to what end would I track it? I'm, I'm basically looking at uh, a couple of metrics for my business. I'm looking at revenue, right? And I'm looking at the uh, costs associated with generating that revenue. And if something is telling me or if an audience member is telling me this is great, then that's a proxy for this could generate revenue, right? And so I don't, I don't have like episode title in one cell and then the next cell it's, you know, the time it took me to create it and then the third cell it's number of unsolicited responses. I don't look at that whatsoever. I have my little playbook for the life cycle of one episode, 
you know, the culminating existence or the, the biggest possible version of an episode is I use it in a speech. And because speaking is, the, is a big revenue generator for me. And so I know where the story could go, provided it gets enough strong reaction. But that's enough for me. So I don't have a spreadsheet. I don't track these things. My goal isn't final success. My goal is just constant improvement. And I guess when you're testing so frequently at a very small scale, it actually becomes impractical to really track everything on, on such a, a macro level, really. I, I just, I never want to know. And I don't think you can know. I think when we have a best practice, that's what we're striving for when we track stuff. It worked to write a list article, write more list articles. I think when you do things that way, you tend to get really stale and you tend to copy what others are doing. And that leads to average work. And, and I know nobody aspires to do average work or feel average fulfillment or get average results. But when we're looking to stop growing, you know, you become this hardened cell that's in protect mode. It's sort of like just do what the data said worked before over and over again. You stop experimenting and stop growing. And so it's my opinion that, you know, when we when we make the process the point instead of end results, when we make learning the point, you tend to get better end results because you're voracious about the process. You seek it out more. You love it. You want to do it better. You experiment with it. Um, instead of saying, let's, we have to grow our followers on Twitter this percent by this date. Now you're like, oh my God, uh, I'll do anything, anything. It doesn't matter. The process to me doesn't matter. You're telling me I can press this button and get the results. Great. But you didn't learn anything along the way. So the next time you have a different goal, it's like, oh my God, I'm starting from panic again. I got to start from scratch. I love the process. You know, I'm fortunate that I found a job that lets me like the process. I realize not everybody has that luxury or has that yet. And I, and I hope you do find it. Um, but, you know, for me, I think whether you have a boss pressing down upon you for results right now, or you have a solo individual kind of entrepreneurial path, if you make learning and constant improvement the goal, the results tend to follow. Because the only way you improve is by, you know, holding yourself accountable and trying to improve on whatever happened before in your own context, right? And so over time, it compounds. So make lifelong learning the goal instead of some sort of quick hit result. Yeah, and uh, that, I totally uh, understand that as well. I totally uh, feel the same way. And you know, a sales, a sales manager at a company I used to work for, uh, he had a little uh, theory that was, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. <laughs> But what that basically means is if you keep doing what you, you always uh, do, then you'll never really learn and you never really improve because you're just doing what you think works. And ultimately in marketing, those things that work don't last very long ever. So you always need to constantly be trialing and testing the new things to actually really understand what's resonating and working with people moving forwards. Yeah, exactly. I wish I, I, I desperately want to know who said this quote. It wasn't me. So I have to defer credit here, but I, I don't know the person who said this. So I apologize if someone listening actually knows. But, um, you know, you have the old, I think, Einstein adage about the definition of insanity, which is doing the same things and expecting different results. This person that I fail to remember said, especially in marketing, doing the same things you did before and expecting the same results that is the definition of insanity. And, <laughs> and that seems to be our goal in marketing. It's to how close can we get to not having to think anymore? How close can we get to not having to do the hard work of experimentation or talking to customers or keeping up with you know, our craft? We want to get to the point where all we have to do forever from here on out is write list articles as one example. And what that tells me is you just want your job to be done. Like you just want to go home, you know, like you, you just want to get rid of this work from your place. So maybe take a hard look in the mirror and just, and think about why, why we're acting that way. Do we not like our boss, our client, our team that we manage, the company, the industry? Like to me that, that feels like it's from a place of fear or unhappiness. And, and that's just such a shame because we only get one life. You, you don't want to spend your career working on it from a place of fear or unhappiness, you know, and, and obviously there's mitigating circumstances. Some people need money for other things. And I, I get that sometimes you just need a job. But when all we want is to be done learning, when all we want is to know the way that we put on repeat to get the same result we got before, it's almost like you stop mattering in that work. And that I don't know, that's just, that's just a shame. 
I agree. I totally agree. I'd love to start talking about your podcast, if that's okay. I mean, for, sure. for anybody who hasn't listened yet, it's called Unthinkable. You've had phenomenal success with it. Uh, you started the podcast in 2016, in March 2016. You've got five-star ratings, and it's been critically acclaimed by many people and publications. So, you know, tell me more. Why, why did you decide to start the podcast? For sure. So uh, I used to struggle with this question because I think what people want is some kind of really strategic answer about how it would benefit my business. But the, the real truth is it looked like a lot of fun. Like it looked like a lot of fun to launch a podcast and try and imitate some of the things I admire from Radio Lab and This American Life and Reply All and some of the, the shows that I love that have a production quality to them. Um, so I just wanted to try and have fun. And I also wanted to send up a little bit of a flair to at first the marketing world. It's really expanded since then. But I, I started the show as a journey to understand this, this gap that exists in a lot of our work. It's, it's this gap between the work we're doing now and the work we want to do. Like we don't want to be average, but we allow ourselves or fall victim to a lot of average tactics and best practices and, and conventional thinking. And that informs our work. And so we just do like a five out of 10 over and over again, but we want to be a 10 out of 10. So I'm like, I don't want to help you get up to speed. I don't want the one-on-one tips and tricks, how to stuff on my show. Let me go find people whose work has been a tremendous success for them, however they define it but it looks crazy from the outside. And then when I tell their story, every time it's not crazy at all, they just know something about their context, about their situation that we don't know. All we know is the best practice and in general, the best practice works. Well, nobody operates in a generality. Let's hear about a specific situation. You know, it's, it's Matt on his podcast and Matt knows X about his customer. You couldn't possibly know that. Matt used that in his work and he found a better answer or a better result than any best practice could have delivered. And so that's the, that's the cause, that's the reason. It's really a human desire. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to serve this audience. And the re results were a nice benefit. Yeah, and I guess these unexpected results can come out of people's passion, really. I, I think exclusively. I think it's, it, when, especially when it's a creative craft, it's really obvious when you were having a bad day or you were sick or you, you were annoyed or stressed. Like, it's just, you are the work. And it, the work isn't you. It's a subtle difference. It's just what you're doing right now. But if I plucked you out of that work and replaced you with somebody who was similar but still different, that work would change in some way. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're an owner of a business, you might want people at your business to act more like cogs in a machine that are interchangeable. But the fact is, it is you. It is something that it matters, the person doing the work. So I don't know if results can come from a place of no passion at all. At least that's been my experience. And what strategies do you use to promote the podcast? What, what, what did you use when you first started, for example, to promote episode one? What, what, what did you do? For sure. So I, I, the first thing I did was I wrote a blog post just declaring why I was doing this. And so I wrote this article titled, How to Work in Marketing When You're Bothered by Suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I explained, you know, like for me, it always starts with a side project. And that's when I know if I'm launching a side project and I have a day job, something at the day job isn't satisfying me. And I just explained my own personal journey in marketing and, you know, some of the annoyance I felt towards a lot of the hucksters and the hype and the shortcut seeking that we feel uh, either because we feel stressed or because we don't care about the audience for some, um, which again is a shame. But I just felt there wasn't a home base that I had in the industry. And so I wanted to create it, create something I wanted to exist and send up a flare and see if others would come running towards it and say, oh, I want that to exist too. So I started with this article that I wrote. Uh, and then to be honest, it's just been producing a better and better episode every time. Like the best marketing I've done is improving the product, is making it more worthy of people's time, getting more people who start the episode to finish the episode too. Um, cause I think all we want is more, more, bigger, bigger, but if you can make something deeper and better, that tends to be the byproduct is it grows bit by bit and the people it grows to, they don't churn through it. And then they're on to the next competitor. Cause that's like digging a hole in dry sand. That's most of marketing. I think the people it expands to, albeit more slowly stick around. 
you know, they become the people who go from the show to the newsletter. And then, you know, I write this monthly or excuse me, weekly newsletter. It's got one big idea for being better than best practices and then some kind of roundup from the show. And so it's like those things, again, it's like, I'm sort of like people like this, I'm putting it on my newsletter. People like that, I'm putting it in my speeches. And it's like, can I slowly grow these concentric, concentric circles from the original crew that came with me on this journey to more and more people? But I never want that circle to grow in the opposite direction. And then I have to start all over. I always want to catch 10 people, 12 people, 100 people at a time that stay instead of 100,000. And then I'm starting from scratch. Because I've experienced the opposite, Matt. I've experienced writing a blog post on Medium, getting featured on the homepage, getting 2 million views on that article and tons of shares and famous people sharing it and then no one sticks around because they don't actually care, yep. right? So I'm, I'm in the mode of make them care. So honestly, the best marketing I have is twofold. One, I make the show better every time. And two, I do video calls with a small number of listeners so I can continue to improve the show. And it seems to have worked from there. And that's really interesting about the video calls. Um, so you'll actually hold a, a video call with how many people? So I send out a, an invite list. Um, I got away from it the last couple of months as I started my book, but I really, every month, every month, every month, every month, I'd send out an invite list for, um, I don't know, maybe six calls throughout the month, maybe a little bit more. They'd be one-on-one -on -one calls. Okay. So it's one person signing up for a spot. I use the first half to ask questions of the individual and the second half we talk about whatever they want to talk about and the first half I evolve constantly so it started with just like why did you listen to the show I'm trying to get a feel for like what purpose in their life is my show serving how do I make sure that I articulate that so I can catch some new listeners and also live up to that for my existing listeners every time and then based on what I learned in the first few calls I, I change the questions I ask to constantly learn more things about my audience so that I can go deeper and deeper with them you know I can reference things and that affects big stuff like for example you know the types of episodes and the style but you'd be surprised it also affects little things that have big results like I use the word refreshing a lot to refer to my show and my company that builds podcasts for brands, um, Unthinkable Media. And refreshing is not a word I'd normally use to describe my own work, but because of these video calls, I heard them say it time and time again. So I'm just re reflecting back the words that my listeners use to describe why they liked my show. And now it's just like great marketing positioning, right? So talking to your actual audience can affect the big stuff, but it can also affect something really small and unexpected, like a single word you use that helps get the results you want from that audience. And that's um, a really interesting marketing strategy, really, that you're holding effectively uh, uh, focus sessions, really, one-on-one -on -one focus sessions with your listeners to actually understand deeply you know, what they like and what they don't like and what they think about your podcast, but then actually using that for only half the, the time of the call so they get the value on the other half of the call by asking you questions and, and understanding, uh, you know, learning things from, from you, really. So it's a win-win, it's a, it's a really. Oh, 100%. And that I never want it to be just a, a, a pull, you know, from, from you to me. Hey, I want that value. Uh, I want that information. I like it to be a give and take. And so I think a podcast is a great medium, but I think all content really is this, where it is a give and take, even though unlike a video call one-on-one, -on -one, you might not see the audience. You know, it's a give and take in that while I'm speaking right now, you're making judgments about my voice the speed at which I'm talking, the nuance of what I'm saying, how right or wrong I am as it applies to you. It's a give and take whether you want it or not. And again, I think at a macro level, brands don't care about that. They don't recognize that. It's the fire they're scared of and they just want it to be a push model. I'm gonna push my thing to you and I'm gonna pull out the value in dollars. That's not the way of the world anymore. The way of the world is these little moments of give and take that again, if you zigzag a little bit, but ultimately head roughly in the right direction, that's where you get an audience that cares and all the results that follow. And so that's how I structure my show or my uh, video calls. And it's not like a highly scalable tactic, but it's deeply personal, which is comes back to the whole undertone of what we've been speaking here today about. Well, I question that idea of what's scalable. So, so what isn't scalable about the video calls? I'm curious because I have... I think I know what you mean, but what about me doing those video calls doesn't scale? Because then I have a, I have an idea that I want to share after this. So, but I'm curious to learn more about that comment. What doesn't scale? 
Well, I guess from my point of view, I'm thinking that a video call is fairly time consuming, minimum probably an hour with um, a bit of prep involved uh, on both sides so that you can get most value from, from what you're doing. And then I guess you'll have to understand or write up or document what you've learned so that then you can iterate on that moving forward so it's not necessarily a you know one minute two minute thing it's it's you know it's it, you could you could only do a limited amount of those per day right exactly so it's it's the construct it's the um the channel or the container doesn't scale right it's uh, a video call that lasts an hour or I think I actually do half an hour, um, and it's five to six people. It's the mechanics of setting it up, scheduling it, writing the notes, reflecting on the notes. That is the kind of container. It's the construct or the mechanics of these calls. That does not scale. It's like a rigid piece of, I don't know, Tupperware. That's like you can't just move the walls to the left and the right. It does not scale, correct. But what scales, back to my point before of if something works, do more with it, is the stuff inside the container. So I learn from these people in such a deep way, in such a transformative way, because it's an actual conversation that I can pluck that out of one interaction or pluck it out of 12 interactions. And that information that I learn scales magically, right? Because I can use it, like I mentioned with the word refreshing, I can use that on the microphone, in my writing, talking to you as an interviewee on your show, Matt, on the paraphernalia or, or a uh, brochureware that I use to promote unthinkable media in my book, everywhere I am, I can use the word refreshing that scales amazingly well. Yeah. Um, so it's it's bits like that, that when people talk, oh, that doesn't scale, what are they talking about? I think they're talking about the container instead of the benefit of what's inside. But the benefit of what's inside is what people want. They want the good, they want the education or the entertainment value of the article, not an article. And so you can rip it out of the article and put it in other articles or social channels or podcasting, et cetera. So when we talk about that won't scale, I think we just need to be more aware or, or sensitive to what we're talking about. And so I love doing the non-scalable thing because I came out of the startup world. Turns out the non-scalable things teach you the stuff that get you to scale. Yeah, that to makes total sense as well. If You'll never find out what those scalable things are unless you're doing the things that won't scale in the first place. Right. You're like preparing to be awesome before you're okay, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I, you know, I don't know if this is a big enough room for my home gym. It's not going to be able to fit... 12 different workout machines. It's like, you're not even exercising at all right now. It's like, can you just fit one exercise machine and do like f one day a week for a little while? Like, yeah, it's funny. You don't, you don't ever skip to the end, but it's funny how much we want to skip to the end in marketing so much so that it affects like our storytelling. You know, we, we say this is the way of the world. So buy our product and we skip the middle of the story, which gets people to buy the product. This is the way of the world and this causes all this conflict. And so here's why you're going through that strife and struggle and we get it and it's this and this and this. And oh, by the way, the resolution to that conflict is this way of the world. And oh, by the way, again, we have a product for that. Like every little moment in marketing from the stories we tell to the way we treat our channels and tactics to the way we measure, it's like we're trying to skip the middle part and instead of starting at the beginning, we want to start at the end. Results. Right now, press a button, it comes out. And so I don't, I don't think anybody that you look at as an innovator in marketing, they don't see around corners. They just see the world the way it is right now, which is start at the beginning and inform every other step with the audience. And then out of the podcast, you're now helping people through, uh, you, you, you're about to launch uh, Unthinkable Media to help people with you know, their podcast and their business as well. Please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for asking. So uh, a funny thing happened when I started the show. It didn't grow a big audience, but it grew a resonant one, one that was passionate and engaged. And so I started digging into the mechanics of how you create those experiences. You know, instead of uh, pumping out a lot of episodes to rank higher on Apple Podcasts, how do you create episodes that, you know, people want to reach out to you afterwards or they want to subscribe to stick around? And in other words, how do you get people to the end of an episode? Because that's what episodes are. That's what most content is. Get them to the end. And, and so as I dug into that stuff, I realized a lot of this is hard. A lot of this is teachable. Is this important to marketers? And if you step back a moment, you realize that we're living through this shift in marketing that's more fundamental than most of us talk about. Most of us talk about the industry's reaction to the shift, which are things like content marketing, social media, and influencers. But the shift 
or the foundation under that is this movement from marketers having to care about acquisition, in other words, acquiring people's attention, over to people having in, in marketing having to get good at holding attention. Time spent, which builds trust, which builds an audience, which gets all the conversions people are looking for in marketing. So we're so obsessed with acquiring attention, we don't often think about holding attention, but that's what marketers have to master today to be effective. And so it turns out a great vehicle for holding attention is create a great show. So that's kind of the strategic reason I launched Unthinkable Media. It's to teach those mechanics and also help test and incubate new shows along with brand partners in the B2B space. But aside from the strategic reason, reason there is a personal reason, which is I, I just... I get so frustrated that we all feel such meaning and emotion in the work that we do, but the content about the working world fails to deliver on that. It's flat, it's redundant, it's boring. And so I envision a world where media about work is just as entertaining and refreshing as, and there's that word again, refreshing, but as all the other stuff, sports, entertainment, you name it. And so I want, like, that's the, I found the Venn diagram overlap of a personal desire to create entertaining shows about work and a strategic reason that others in marketing would care, which is we have to master the ability to hold attention and out came unthinkable media. So it's an education company that also incubates probably 10 shows a year with B2B brands. And the goal is let's test our way forward, involve the audience, and let's create like head turning programs about the working world. That's phenomenal. I love the I love the concept there. And can people actually uh, contact you and and apply to be on these programs with you? Uh, so so we don't take inbound guest requests, okay. but we do. But I am obviously looking for partners all the time, both like co co, -pro co marketing partners, uh, distribution partners, and clients. And so, you know, the way I work with these clients is we I've created what I call the small comedy club for branded podcasts. So back back to the comedian example. You go to small clubs and work on that material and work on your performance. Then you make the big stink about the big special on Netflix. So I created something called the Maker Channel, which launches this spring. And the Maker Channel is one podcast feed with a bunch of shows that are in development, all running simultaneously in that feed. You know, maybe twice a week you get a different episode. And the goal is with a brand, we're going to distill your brand down to its bare bones. Why do you exist? What better world are you building and how is that different from your competitors? And then we build up a concept that we think is different, entertaining, uh, refreshing. And then we test that concept in the maker channel. So whether you're the host or I'm the host or we bring in another host, the goal is like, let's launch, learn and iterate rapidly the lean startup methodology way to improve this show such that when we launch, it's not a five out of 10, it's a, as close to a 10 out of 10 as humanly possible. Um, and so that's how I work with these companies. We go from scratch to testing mode, and then we kind of send them on their way. The analogy I use, aside from the comedian thing, is some agencies want to build you the plane, and that's what they charge for. We want to help people test pilot that plane with a few passengers that are excited to be on board in these risky early days and get feedback and all that good stuff so that your launch will be way more successful. And where can people find out more about this? So we launched the website at the uh, end of... February. It'll be unthinkablemedia.com. In the meantime, you can just shoot me an email. It's just jay at unthinkablemedia.com. Uh, or you can follow along. I'm actually doing a behind the scenes diary of building the business in my podcast, Unthinkable. Okay. So I'm going to jump into our last five questions here. Five quick fire questions. So number one, what's your best piece of marketing advice? Focus on resonance, not reach. Number two, can you recommend a book to our listeners? Any collection of Calvin and Hobbes comics. Okay. <laughs> and number three, which software tool couldn't you live without? Evernote. Perfect. And number four, what's your favorite example of a marketing campaign? Ooh. I'm going to go with Death Wish Coffee's Super Bowl campaign. It was uh, the the peak, the, the, the success story after years of struggling of a company that chose to do something differently and build and create the world's strongest coffee. So uh, Death Wish Coffee, the entire story would take me too long to explain, but you can go to my show, you can go to Unthinkable and you can listen to uh, a podcast called Best Practices. It's way back in the archives, but Death Wish is 
one of my favorite brands and their Super Bowl ad was something to behold. Cool, I'll definitely check that out. And lastly, which other podcasts do you listen to? I love, uh, I, you know, it's it's mostly non-business shows that I love, but one I'm, I'm really fascinated by and I'd love to imitate at some point to try my hand at it is a show called The Way I Heard It with Mike Rowe, who is a former TV host. So the show is what he calls the only podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span. It's maybe six minute stories where he tells the backstory of something we've all heard of but you haven't heard it told this way. And at the end, he reveals what it was. So it's a little bit of a guessing game. He's an amazing storyteller. It's just him scripting it and reading it, but he's got a way with words. So it's the way I heard it. You will not regret it. It's really short and it's delicious. Excellent. I'll definitely check that out as well. Well, thank you very much, Jay. It's been an absolute pleasure and I feel like I could carry on talking to you for quite a long time, to be <laughs> honest. Um, but uh, really nice to have you on the show today and everyone check out Unthinkable and um, check out Unthinkable Media uh, when the uh, website launches in a, a few weeks and also look out in the next few months for uh, a book that Jay's launching off the back of the podcast as well. Does that have the same name, Unthinkable? The book is called Break the Wheel, and it's about getting out of this endless cycle of best practices, conventional wisdom, and trendy tactics. So Break the Wheel, that'll be this fall. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jay. Pleasure to have you on today. So much fun. And if you listened all the way to the end, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with your friends. I'd also be extremely grateful if you could rate and review us on iTunes or the channel you get this podcast through. Next week, I'm joined by Hannah Abaza, Head of Marketing for Shopify Plus. Hannah's managed the marketing department for fast-growing startup Uberflip and has more recently moved to Shopify. We discuss how she transitioned and the different approaches both companies take to marketing. Hannah provides a really interesting insight, so I'd highly recommend tuning in. So until next time, I've been your host, Matt Byron. <laughs>